Welcome to the June uh, Reef Seekers, uh, Zoom Seekers. Um, so we're, we're sort of in our artsy fartsy phase. Uh, Stephen Holman, who's on this call, was was with us last month. Also had a very successful scuba show. I'm not saying it was because of us, but uh, it's nice to get your art, <laughs> artwork out there. And uh, Stephen was a painter. And now we're going to sort of shift modes into sculpting, which is what our uh, our speaker tonight does. And um, he sort of indirectly credits me uh, <laughs> with with him getting in, in right. sculpting. Well, that's true. That on uh, that on um, he was with me on a Sea Cortez trip, and um, the short version of it, without the em embarrassing portions, was he really wanted to see hammerheads. And um, we we were diving uh, off of Los Animas, a place called the Pinnacles, and he and his buddy at the very very end of their dive had had three hammerheads come in and circle in and, and, and stuff like that. So uh, I, I, I told him the other day, I said, I guess I'm, I'm taking credit for igniting this passion because he said, as you may have read in, in the blurb I wrote, that he then wanted to get something to commemorate that, but he couldn't find anything uh, that he felt was worthy of displaying in his house. So he said, I'll just make something on my own. And sculpting became, became a passion for him. So our speaker tonight, he says it much better than my fake uh, French accent when I go Victor Dueb, but uh, uh, he, he can say everything better. But Victor um, has been diving with reef seekers for years and years. He's done a number of trips with us besides that Sea of Cortez trip, but he's really gotten into the sculpting thing uh, to the point where it's become a, not only a passion, but a business. I was over at his house um, the other day. Some of the photos you'll see are from when we were there. And I mean, we're talking massive pieces, heavy. I mean, this isn't just like, you know, taking a bar of soap and sculpting something that looks like looks like a fish. So we want to um, let you know what his process is and show you a bunch of the work. And of course, if there's anything that floats your boat, I'm sure you can contact him afterwards and you can make a deal. So um, I'll take what's up behind door number two, Kurt, uh, Victor. So anyhow, without further ado, please give a warm Zoom Seekers welcome Thank to you. Victor Dueb. Victor, you got it. Okay. So thank you for everybody to be here. And um, what I'm going to do today, I'm going tonight, I'm going to explain you the process of uh, sculpting from picture that I took on the water, or inspiration when I spent time in Africa or in um, animal sanctuary. That's when I connect with an animal and I feel like I really want to sculpt it. So I use my own picture, or I know enough, or I know enough people in the in the diving world and in Africa to send me the detailed picture that I need. Because as you as you're gonna see, I'm very detail oriented in my work. So <laughs> it's not always great because I'm spending way too much time. But I it's it's a passion, so I have to be satisfied with a piece to be able to keep one for me in my studio or in my home. So um, we're going to start this process, and uh, hopefully you understand, and welcome to ask any question at the end uh, if something is not clear for you, because a lot of people ask me so many questions about how I started. Some people think I take a block of metal and I just carve it. It's a little bit more complicated than just taking a piece of metal or wood or anything and carving. So let's see let's it. All right. Okay. Thank Fingers crossed that this works the way I think it's going to work. And I'm watching a separate screen so we can see if here's the magic. Yeah, it's bingo, bingo, bango, bongo. All right. So when I get my inspiration for any animal, I came home to my studio and I decide uh, to create the piece. So before I put any clay on any, any, any shape of clay, I have to do a wire. So I have to, I have to have the piece pretty much set the way I want it, and start putting wire, and that's going to be like on this piece, by example, I was doing a bear, a grizzly bear. So I had to define the piece, the way it's going to be standing, the way his arm are uh, uh, positioned, pretty much the whole position has to be set before, especially the size, because if you put clay without the support under it would fail. So that's the beginning of the grizzly bear. And you're going to see another picture. So I actually use uh, aluminum wire 
and actually plumbing pipe behind to hold it. So I'm going to show you another picture where you understand better when the grizzly was almost finished. All right, so what with the position of the wire that I put, you see, you know, the not the end result, but pretty much the end result of the piece. But that's just the beginning of the process. And that takes usually a few weeks for me just to create, to create and to make sure I have all the picture that I need need to finish every detail that I needed. So I'm going to show you a little bit of my studio where I do the metal, metal chasing. Um, let's go on the next one, uh, Ken. So this is one of the places. I have actually two places where in my studio where I do the metal chasing. means when I get the piece in metal, I do um, all the detailing. I used to be a dental technician. So it's a little bit easier for me to work with dental tool, dental technician tool. And on this chair right here, that's where I do all the detailing. And I have another space in my studio where I do the, the clay. So I have a, pretty much a stand and um, a large table. And that's where I start the wire and putting the clay together. So let's, um, let's move on. All right, so I'm going to start with one of the latest pieces that I decided to do, I decided to do a, a crocodile. I didn't know how complicated and detailed it was. So I took the picture I needed, I asked picture, and I started with, uh, um, this piece has no base. I'm not creating any base. It's going to be freestanding. So what I did, I figured out the size I want and start bending wire the way I need, they need to be done, bent to be able to have the shape. So after this, the body shape that I did, I start adding, adding the, some, some aluminum wire for the legs. But this is pretty much all is going to be to support the clay because it's a small size. So I have different size of wire for different size of pieces. So that's the beginning of the, of the crocodile. All right, so as you can see, I have some kind of shape. It doesn't really look like anything right now, but I have the shape, I have the legs. So now I'm going to start printing as many detailed pics that I can to add every detail that I can put on. And of course, as small as a piece, I complicate the detail at all. So let's, um, let's get to, um, that's pretty much the same. All right. So you can see, I find a nice picture for the tail. And, um, it's probably, I would say, one foot, maybe? One foot, yeah. So this is one foot crocodile, and I'm adding every day more and more detail, all the, all the scale I'm adding. And um, I work with magnifier because it's such a small piece that I want to be as accurate as possible. I get a little bit too crazy a little bit on, on those details. And I unfortunately have to pay the price because when I have to polish a piece like this, uh, at this size, it's a nightmare. But uh, this is who I am. So this is how I keep moving forward, adding detail and detail. But when this piece was over, even if I was satisfied, I decide that this piece was... Uh, a little small, and it was not look good enough in my table. So I decided to, <laughs> to go on the next size, a way bigger size. So that's a still the same, same piece. As you can see, I put more and more scale. Every day I was working probably four or five hours on it, and I was still, I feel like I was not even moving. After I did all this, I was like, wow, I still have all the body to detail and get the legs, the, the toes. It, it was crazy. This piece was is probably so far the most complicated piece that I that I started. But uh, I also like challenge. So uh, I get one for sure. All right, so when the piece is finished, um, no matter what size it is, I bring this to a, a mold maker. All right, so the mold maker take the piece and put a, uh, put a, a plaster around. And when the plaster is closed, he put he pours silicone inside. So the silicone is really precise and it's going to give, give me all the detail that I 
create on the piece. So this is um, the second part of the mold is pouring actual, actually the silicone inside. Inside the mold, inside the plaster, my piece is inside. So you can see better. This is actually not the crocodile. This is actually a big bull shark that I sculpt. And um, you can see uh, the one further is uh, the head and the one right in the front is the tail. So it's, I had to cut the bull shark in two pieces. It was too big to be able to, um, to, to make the mold. And, and some pieces goes, some pieces I make three or four molds for each pieces. So let's see the, the next, you can, on the next. Actually, Victor, let me interject a sec, just ask a question. How yeah. long does that all have to stay clamped together till that mold all, all sets? A few days because everything has to cure. You don't want to open it and because you have to cut the silicone. So you don't want to open it and start cutting when, um, when it's not cured yet. So you just have to wait, you know, it's like two, two days depend also of the weather. When it's hot, it cure faster than it, when it's you know cold outside. But the point is not not a fast process. No, it's not a fast process. But you have to be patient. It's actually giving me a break from the piece and uh, just uh, just get get out of this piece for a few days. It allowed me to uh, when I get the, the when I get the mold to be ready for moving forward. So on the next piece, so you see the silicone and the plaster behind. Inside the silicone, there is a shark in clay. So I think there is a slide where you can see the shark inside. Here, here it is. So um, like I told you, the back, the back mold is a shark inside with the silicone removed so you can see there is enough space to pour silicone to go over all the detail because you will not be able to uh, get a mold with a plaster and get the detail and the plaster will attach to the to the, the clay. So the first they do the, the 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 plaster around and they leave some room and put the silicone inside so where I have all the detail inside. So that's um that's the mold and you can see uh, on the on the left on the last left this was actually the crocodile mold. And you can see it was, yeah, you can see all the detail inside. So when I get this part, I get um, the crocodile with I think was probably two, I think it was two pieces. So when I get this from the mold maker, I bring this back home. Sometimes I ask him to do it, but I bring them home and I have a huge bucket of wax that I melt. And when, you know, it takes two, three hours to melt. So I wake up early and I turn on the bucket. When it's, when it's melt, completely melt, I pour the wax inside the bucket all the way up. All right. So I filled up the old mold with wax. I take, I, I, I wait 20 minutes until it starts cooling down a little bit. I take it off. I pour everything out. So it gives me a very thin layer of wax with all the shape of each part of the crocodile. So this is what I get when I open each mold and I get um, the crocodile in pieces. That's a big one. So this is not even, this is just the beginning for me. Even if all the mold is made, because from there, I take this on my table and I start adding even more detail. Because like I said, I'm, I, when I was when I was waiting to get the mold, I was still looking at picture of crocodile, and more I look at picture and more I find detail that I should add to my piece. So I collect all those photos. I you know con uh, contact some people who spend time with crocodile because it became a big a big thing diving with crocodile. I don't know if everybody heard about it, uh, but a lot of my friends now who used to dive with shark dive with crocodile. So it's, it's interesting. But so I get picture from all my friends and um, I get when the mold, when I actually remove the wax from the mold, I sit down and spend maybe another week of re-detailing because you lose, you lose a little bit of detail when you pour the wax. And as you know, this edition is eight, eight crocodile. So as the edition goes, more I pour 
wax in the mold, more I lose detail. So more I'm going to spend time on each piece. And I'm spending the same time, actually, I spend more time on the second, third, fourth, you know, all the way to eight because I'm losing detail. So the first one is going to be very detailed because the silicone is still, you know, it didn't crack anyway and it's still great. On the second one, I'm already starting to lose detail. So I have to keep adding time to re-detail those pieces. So what I want to do is actually, what I want to get is this. Okay, that's a bronze uh, crocodile. So, but I'm going to explain you the process to go from the wax to the, to the bronze or stainless steel. I cast my work in bronze or stainless steel. Bronze needs to be, needs to have a patina because uh, leaving the bronze without any patina or any treatment will oxidize. So I have to do treatment or adding a patina, but this is what I want to accomplish when I get uh, the wax. So when I finish with the wax, um, I bring it to the foundry. So I bring those three pieces to the foundry where they actually uh, make another mold of each. So I think there is a pic of it um, coming up, yeah. So they put some sprue on the side. It allowed the metal to be injected inside. But what they do, they're dipping for almost a week to have a, a, a nice thickness of mold. So inside this mold again, there is my wax of each pieces. So they dip it inside, let him cool down, let him, let him, let him uh, dry, dip again until the thickness is, um, until this mold is thick enough to receive uh, a metal, metal inside, so liquid metal. So they put the second mold that they made inside the oven. I think it's around 1800 degrees or something like this. And they start melting bronze or stainless steel. So this is a bucket where they, I don't know how many kilo inside, but um, it's, it's pretty heavy and it's pretty big. And they melt this until all the bronze became completely liquid. So when it's liquid, they have some kind of machine to lift it up and and pour, so that's that's a, that's a metal ready for uh, pouring inside each mold. So, and this is what they do. They filled up each mold with um, a liquid bronze or liquid stainless steel inside the, this shell, this mold, and they let him cool down for, you know, hours. And uh, after this, they actually, uh, they use armor or they use, you know, some, tool to, to break the shell. And after breaking the shell, they sandblasted the piece and give it to me. So that's uh, the, the next piece you're going to see. It's uh, now it's actually still, it's actually still. No, the, so that looks still pretty hot. Yeah, it's pretty hot. It takes, you have to let him rest. Even if they, cool, uh, they cast early morning, you, you don't get your piece be you know, before late afternoon or the day after it's better. And this is what you get. You get, um, you know, this one was uh, a Mako that I made. Um, actually, I had to create a base also. But the Mako was uh, one, two, three, four, five pieces. So there is, they actually cut under the mouth of the Mako to uh, allow the gas to get out. And uh, they cut also the mouse, and it would be welded later on. But this is, this is how pretty much how ugly the metal looks. That's stainless steel. Huh? This is what the metal looks like when it came out from the foundry. When I pick it up, that's what I get. And uh, I start, from this, I start doing the chasing and the welding. So, so this is what it looks like at the end, but that's a bronze one. But before it gets like this, it's, it's weeks and weeks of work. So I work with a welder and I weld fusing myself, but um, this is the blue shark that I did, and this is all the piece together. So uh, the shark was in two pieces, the base was in three pieces. So from this play, this part, I start chasing and welding. Chasing is taking all the little um, porosity. Sometimes when the middle is not hard enough, you get a lot of little dots inside. Um, so you have to do a lot of welding because sometimes when you polish, 
a little holes came out here and there. So you have to keep adding welding until it's perfect. So stainless steel is a beautiful metal to work with. It's, uh, it, looks, it looks chrome, but it's actually not chrome. It's high polished stainless steel. So it doesn't oxidate it. It doesn't, um, it resists pretty much to everything. And years and years later, it's still gonna look the same. It's really hard to work with. Not too many sculptors wants to work on stainless steel. It's much easier to take any metal and chrome them, but chrome will peel off later on. This stainless steel will not peel off, will stay the same way forever. And you can also repolish if you want it. You can, uh, I use some stuff for my fridge to polish it when I need it, just to clean it up. So it's a very strong metal. It's really hard to weld because when you weld it, it is, gets so liquid. I don't know if you saw like the movie with Schwarzenegger, it gets as liquid as this, you know, it's just like dripping. So if you have um, a little problem somewhere and you want to rebuild a fin or uh, an eye, it's, it's very difficult because when you add welding to stainless steel welding to the piece, it just leaks everywhere. So you have, to be, you have to be pretty good at it. So, and when the piece is weld and polish, um, the stainless steel stay the same way. The bronze, I have to do the patina on it. So patina, it's chemical that I apply with the torch. I heat up the piece really hot and I use different chemical to, uh, with a brush. So I use sometimes spray bottle and sometimes I use uh, a brush like this. This actually, this piece was actually a silver nitrate. It's pretty uh, toxic uh, chemical that I use it for to create the oceanic whitey with, I would say, as as colorful as I need it and as accurate as I see on the water. Um, the difference between patina and painting, it's it you cannot really get the you know the same effect that the painting. Painting, uh, you know, when you control very very well the color, you can get really really close to you know whatever you're looking for. Chemical can change because the metal is too hot, the chemical is not mixed well, um, the way you apply the chemical is not the same way every time. So if somebody wants a piece, usually I said, take the one you see because I cannot guarantee the same patina twice. So I takes hours. If I want to do two color, I have to cover the base with uh, uh, um, foil, folding paper to, to make sure the silver nitride doesn't leak on the base. So it's plenty of chemical. It's um, pretty toxic. And uh, it's, you know, the, the result looks pretty good. I, uh, I I try to do my own patina all the time by myself, but sometimes I'm running to any problem, so I have to call somebody to help me out. But most of the time I'm trying to do my own patina. And if I really want to get close to what I want, I can also use dye, patina dye, that I could apply with an airbrush on the top. But uh, this is um, the oceanic white tip. I think I have a pick of the oceanic white tip finish. So this, this, is, this is a large size piece. So it's even harder to uh, you know, put on a table, we're moving, uh, go around. But you know, it's, it's fun to do it. I learn most of the, most of the sculpture use or hire patina artists to make it. And uh, for years at the beginning, since I was not sure what I was doing, and I didn't find any way to learn the chemical, I was watching my guy doing it all the time. And I, when I was telling him if I can do this or that, and he was always saying, no, 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 this is the way it is. So I decided to learn on my own. And um, I pretty much figured out how to do the patina. And less you do it, I don't do as much as I used to, but some chemical doesn't mix with each other very well. So you need to learn all the different chemical and what's, which one you put first and which one you put last. And the effect, if you use two chemical at the same time, is going to produce some uh, um, crack line. So whatever effect you want to create on your piece, you need to learn the basic of chemical. And that takes time. That's a stainless steel piece. That's the blue shark that you see earlier in, in metal. In, uh, yeah, and this is a finished piece. 
So I, I love doing shark in stainless steel because, well, first he was my, he was, he was, first he's my favorite animal to start with, but second he was, um, it just goes so well with stainless steel. It's just slick. Uh, I always, uh, every time I finish a stainless steel, stainless steel shark, I just like, wow, this is great. So um, yeah, I always, uh, I, I do enjoy stainless steel a little bit more than, than bronze with patina. All right, so that's another piece that I made it because um, I was trying to figure out how I could help conservation who is creating a piece who could be auctioned and some of the money would be sent to some conservation people that I work with, uh, association. And I was, I came up with this. I came up with, um, I guess if the animal have, have to fight the poacher, they would have to wear camouflage. So I came up with the whole set of um, animal that I are uh, in danger, like shark, um, orangutan, um, rhino, uh, what else I did in camouflage, hippo. So I did a lot of animal to create this, uh, this camouflage series that I was going to auction and uh, help uh, anti-poaching, I guess, you know, anti-poaching team. But um, the, work, the gallery I was working with at the time was not willing to donate as much as I want to, you know. So that was uh, one of my inspiration. Um, that was the orangutan. And, I, and it was interesting because doing those... Um, Camouflage, he actually opened a new market for me. People always know me for doing, uh, you know, pretty realistic patina and stainless steel. And suddenly they see, uh, you know, camouflage. And I start reaching out to people who like pop art work. So it's, it's pretty accurate uh, animal with a pretty wild patina on it. So it's... It was, like I said, it was reaching out different people, different type of people who would not, may, who would not probably buy uh, one of my work because it was too realistic or, or they didn't really like the animal. But as soon as I put a camouflage on it, they, they just love, love it. So that's, um, that was the reason. Um, I'm, I'm still going to try to find out if I can figure out how to auction some piece and donate some of my profit to uh, some association. All right, that's a big bull shark that you see me working earlier. Uh, how big is this? Um, how big is this, Ken? Four, four feet, five feet? I was, well, uh, it's probably four feet, yeah, easily. Yeah. It, it's, it's a big piece. It's, uh, it's on the floor because <laughs> it's heavy. And uh, I did this a while ago and still look good. And I sold a few of them to some lawyer in... Uh, in California, but uh, I kept one for myself. So the big one like this, I only do eight of them because it's too much work and people like to have those pieces and they want to make sure they're not, they're not, they're not, there's not 500 pieces around. So the smaller piece I do sometime all the way to 27 and very small all the way to 50. And when I get to the really big piece, I do seven, one, one plus one AP, that's it. And like for me, it's also nice because when I did seven of them, I'm really tired of this piece. So move on to I move on to another piece. So that's um, all right. Here the oceanic white tip with the patina uh, that I did. Um, that's this is this is the one we saw you preparing a few slides ago, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, oceanic. That's um, I actually took a lot of picture of oceanic. I went to Cat Island with some of my friends who do a lot of shark diving. And I was, uh, I actually, actually sculpted a piece when, when we were coming back from diving in front of people, very, way smaller than this one. This one is huge, but way smaller than this one. So people could, I could use um, the picture of every diver. So we uh, promote this dive trip. I was invited and I said, I'm going to be creating an oceanic white tip because when we go to Cat Island, that's probably, that's what we're going for, oceanic white tip, even if I saw beautiful blue shark. But I told people it was like maybe 10 or 12 diver. And I said, I'm going to use your picture during this week. 
and to creating this piece in the front of you. So you can see the whole process of sculpting live. And um, the, the small piece was done and I offer it to my, my friend who invited me to the strip. So that's a big version of it. You can see there is some little pilot fish that I create under. I am um, pretty uh, detailed. Uh, so the good, that was one of my dreams to be able to create a piece based on the diver picture. So as I was creating the piece, I was missing detail on the tail or anolfin or whatever I was missing, or even some little piece, a little photo of uh, pilot fish. So I was asking the diver, okay, let's focus on getting me some picture of what I need so I can move on. And uh, it was it was a lot of fun. It was a week where uh, everybody um, understand the process and uh, understand how crazy I was for detail because I was... Uh, I took a lot of pictures of the old shark, but sometimes I was just going for a little detail and people were asking me, why are you taking so many pictures of the tail? I said, because I'm going to need it for sculpting. So that's a big one. It's probably as big as a bull shark, I would say. Pretty uh, close, yeah. And beside uh, being freestanding, I create a beautiful, beautiful uh, base on it. So I'm going to talk to you about the base. So... It's very easy to, to, to create a piece and do a freestanding piece. You can put it anywhere. It's freestanding. You don't have to, you don't have to create anything. But m some of my piece, I create a, a, a base. So the base is actually, for me, more difficult than creating the shark or any animal. Because the base has to give me also, um, give me and give you some information about the shark, how it's moving, um, the base has to be beautiful, but it, hasn't, it doesn't have to take away from the, the animal I'm sculpting. So you have to see it, you have to appreciate, but you are, still have to focus on the main piece. So it's, it's a little tricky. So sometimes it takes me weeks to create a base that I like, and if I don't like it, um, I just redo it until I'm satisfied. And um, sometimes I sketch something before I try it, and I... I start it and I don't like it. So, so creating a base is actually another two mold, another two casting, another two welding, another two chasing, and another patina. So uh, the base is, uh, is it's, it's, so when the piece has a base, it's more expensive. That's what I'm trying to say because it's more work for me. I would assume, Victor, there's also an engineering side yeah. that yeah. with the balance, it has to balance right. Because just so you guys understand, I don't remember that we lifted this, but these pieces, the bigger ones, they probably weigh 20, 30 pounds. And you're balancing that on this fairly small, small base, which is no mean feat in and of itself. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm, I want to make sure also, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be able to hold. So sometimes I make also the base a little thicker than a, than a shark. You know, even if all my piece I cast really, really uh, thick because, um, any sculptor would sculpt as thin as I can, as they can, because um, you know you have to pay for the metal, and it's you know it's heavier. It's it's a pain in the ass to sculpt uh, pieces thick. I like it because if I want to add uh, one muscle or if I want to dig inside the metal, I have enough room to grind it, and I'm not gonna create you know find a hole or something. So I like to cast. Pretty thick. That's actually a piece that I did a long time ago after I came back uh, from Tiger Beach. And I um, I was witness of this Toro uh, escaping the shark. And <laughs> she did escape the shark. And when I came back and I was like, wow, I took so many pictures, and I'm like, let, let me let me let me do one uh, one one tiger shark chasing the toro. So it's a pretty old piece. Um, I, you know, I look at some of my old work and I see some stuff that I would do differently now. But I guess it's a process, and I'm sure every artist, when they look back to their beginning work, um, there is a lot they can criticize about. But you know, okay, so this is not stainless steel. This is something I tried not long ago. It's uh, it's actually, it was bronze and it was chrome on top of it. 
So I was exploring to see if it's something I would be interesting to interested to do because polishing a jaw and polishing a shark this size because that's also a big piece. Uh, it's a lot of a lot of time. So I did one in stainless steel, but I had one at home in bronze, and I decided to uh, work with somebody who does chrome and and chrome color and see if it would be something that I would be interested. So I did actually two pieces. I did. I did this piece, and I um, I did um, actually no, I did another great white shark chasing a seal. And just uh, to give you guys an idea of scale, I'd say that thing is probably four feet tall, four feet wide. It's pretty. It's a pretty large piece. Yeah, it's a, it's and it's actually a real jaw, a great white jaw that somebody sent me damaged. So I had to sculpt as much as I can to be able to get a very. Um, a, a great accuracy on the on the great white shark. So I did I did two different chrome. I like it. I don't know if I'm gonna redo it. I explore sometimes a different uh, technique just to see um, just to see if it's something I'm interested. In. And I, I like to kind of reinvent myself and just get get something new. And uh, I like it. I'm not sure if I'm gonna keep doing it because I don't know what it's gonna look like long term. All right. Give me one second here. All right. That's also um, that's also creating. After I came back from one of your trip, Ken, when I saw the first mentor, it was uh, I don't know if you remember. It was in Sea of Cortez. Yeah. Hang on, I'm trying to get rid of uh, this jackass Joe who just yeah you know, so, uh, did did the drawing. Yeah, that's great. One sec, <laughs> uh, it's something with the whiteboard. Well, I kicked him out of the meeting, but there's a juvenile on every corner. So what are you gonna do? Okay. All right, keep going. So yeah, yeah, this trip was absolutely incredible. It was just. Uh, uh, we have a three or four mentor. It was just, they were just swimming. And it, it was incredible. It was a fir my first time seeing mentor. It's it's one of my best memory of diving. It, it was just incredible. So when I came home, of course, I uh, I caught one right away and uh, had the little pilot fish and um, decided to, instead of creating a base, um, create some coral with a small base. And that's the uh, result. It's, it's, it's a nice piece. The patina is beautiful on it, and um, I still have, I still have, I still have this piece at home. All right, next one is a sperm whale. I actually never saw a sperm whale, and um, I, I was just interested about creating a sperm whale. So I, I did this piece, and I was not sure what I was going to, how I was going to mount it. So I started reading about sperm whale, looking at picture, looking at story. And I find out that a um, long time ago, those fishermen were um, taking the sperm whale tooth and sculpt them. And also, as I was reading story about sperm whale, I find out they hunt giant squid. So... I came, I came up with this. A tooth with a giant squid on it will support the sperm whale. That was my idea of putting everything I was learning about together on one piece. What's next? Lionfish. Okay. So that was a great uh, story. I went diving with a friend of mine in, in the Bahamas, and she started explaining me about the invasion of the lionfish. So not only I love the fish because it was complicated and it's beautiful, and I, I like how tricky it was to sculpt it, but I like the story behind. The, I did actually um, a lecture about the lionfish invasion at uh, Long Beach Aquarium. And if I remember correctly, I think I speak about lionfish invasion also in Boston Aquarium, they invite me. So it was a big lecture about um, artwork, conservation, lionfish invasion, how we can um, reduce the invasion of the lionfish, how did it start it. It was great because I was in contact with scientists all the time 
and they send me so many information about lionfish. I became an expert of, of lionfish. So it, the presentation was fun because it was the create. I was, I think, I spent thirty minutes about explaining every step of lionfish, the picture, and the next thirty minutes of the of the lecture was about um, the lionfish, the invasion, how did it start it, how we're going to stop this. So it was great. I think you can probably find um, the lecture somewhere on, online. And it was it was great. So beautiful patina, as you can see. Yep. No, that's good. So I, I I I do also a small piece. So I did a great white coming back from Guadalupe. Uh, those pieces are probably what uh, I would say um, as a side of my hand, maybe. Yeah, they're five six inches each. So going back from Guadalupe, diving with, uh, no, that's not diving, going in a cage with great white. I came back and I sculpted a small one. Um, coming back from South Africa, I did the penguin. And actually, I finished the penguin on uh, Valentine's Day. So it was perfect because I used to know penguin and only one mate for the rest of their life. So it was a good story for me to bring the penguin on Valentine's Day and say, um, here. It's a great gift for your for your girl, <laughs> and the bull shark. Uh, it's uh, pretty much the same as the big one, but so many people ask me, "Love the bull shark? Can you make a small one?" So I finally did it, and um, it was pretty successful piece because it was affordable and you could be you could put it anywhere. That's my home. So some of the pieces that I kept for myself, uh, you can see on the top there is another camouflage rhino coming back from South Africa, watching the anti-poaching team, talking to them, seeing as many rhino left in Africa. I was like, okay, let's, it's time to do this. So you can see a bear, you can see a lionfish, you can see a stainless steel bear, a great hammerhead, uh, a face of a gorilla and stainless steel, and all the, way in, in, all the way down, you can see a black patina uh, the same face, only black patina. Another rhino, great white, supporting by, um, actually, it's a, it's a great white tooth, support the great white. I had another great white on the second shell. Um, yeah, actually, two. I have one in stainless steel, was different than the one in blue, in patina, different shape. A little frog, a big frog, and another hippo with um, pink hippo that I try also with those chrome color. So those pieces, um, I don't think they're gonna go anywhere. I think they, they're great, they look good in my, in my, in my house and uh, don't take too much room, that's my hippo. So uh, you know, starting from chrome all the way to pink. Uh, I'm curious to know, to find out how it's gonna look like you know, in a few years. Everybody's telling me, everybody's using this technique and me, oh, it's great. But, you know, until I, uh, until I find out, it's been a year, I think, or maybe a year that nothing moved so far, but it's not stainless steel. It's a layer of chrome on the top of a bronze rhino. So that's it. And um, this is my living room, uh, kept... Um, the blue shark, the, the actually the reef shark with the blue patina, the great white, one of my first bigger piece that I did, uh, chasing the seal, um, struggling with the base. That was the beginning. I didn't know how to what to create, so I create this wave and uh, put a seal in the front of it. You can see the mako um, with this base was very sharp because. For me, Mako is, for everybody, Mako is the fastest shark in the, in the ocean. And those teeth and those, uh, this pointy nose, that's what I saw right away. And this is what I need to create on my piece. So whatever I, whatever I swim with, any, with shark or any animal, go to Africa and I see an animal that I want to sculpt, the first thing that I'm going to remember, that the first thing that I'm going to accentuate on my piece to be able to um, make you feel what I felt when I saw this animal. So that's uh, the Mako in stainless steel, huge difference. Uh, I like movement too. 
Um, so the Mick was a very nice movement, all stainless steel. I'm actually making another one, the same one. And the hammerhead, the famous hammerhead that I create coming back from the trip in Sea of Cortez. So that's my first piece. So the patina was not, uh, that somebody who did the patina for me and I was not happy about it, but I thought that's all you can do. So I, of course, I'm going to keep this piece because I sold a bunch of it. It's unbelievable. Um, I came back and people start liking the work. And um, that's uh, my first hammerhead shark coming back from Sea of Cortez. That's the piece who create uh, all those pieces. You have a um, whale shark. You have a sand tiger that actually sculpt live at the aquarium in uh, Long Beach Aquarium, I ask. Uh, I spend a little bit of time in the uh, inside the shark aquarium with my uh, underwater uh, photograph, uh, you know, my camera, underwater camera. Took my own pic, and I was uh, the week after. I bring a table, and I was sculpting in front of people. So it was it was great to put one and one together. So instead of explaining people that I dive and I take picture and I use my picture. They let me in in the shark tank for I don't know, 20, 30 minutes, enough time for me to take picture of the sun tiger and find me a nice space when I was able to sculpt. I didn't sculpt a lot in front of people because people were asking me questions all the time. So, but, you know, they saw the process. They, I think I did the three weeks um, in a row at the aquarium where they would be able, they, 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 they was, they were able to see me sculpting. Then in between each uh, aquarium day, I was adding some work uh, to the piece. So I'm not coming back the week after with nothing done. So they can see the progress and people keep coming back every weekend and look at the progress of the sand tiger. So you can see on one side, I took one, I did one in stainless steel and one in uh, patina. So yeah, that's, and that's it. Thank you very much. Very good. We give you Thank the appropriate you. Zoom seekers uh, welcome. Let me un, un re camera myself here and let me click back over to that. Okay. So, um, pretty cool. Kaz says, I just looked this up on Google to disable. Oh, that, yeah. Thank you, Kaz. Yeah, I, I found uh, I was able to get rid of that and I don't know who the guy was and, you know, gee, how, how clever. I'll draw. I'll draw a penis on, on stuff, and then leave the meeting. Whoop de do. Um, <laughs> yeah, what are you gonna do? Uh, it takes it takes all kinds. So, Victor, I will. I get to start the first question. I don't know what other questions we have, guys. You can either use the raise your hand thing, or actually just physically raise your hand. But uh, give people an idea if anybody was interested in buying one of the pieces. What do you What are you charging for stuff? Well, the small piece goes from probably 3,000 to 5,000 stainless steel. And the big, big one goes all the way to 40,000. They are pricey, uh, but I spend a lot of time on it. But Steve, you know, Stephen Holman right now is going, wait, I need to, I need to get 40,000 for my paintings too. Well, I hope you do. <laughs> I do that much quicker though. <laughs> not, not, not a lot quicker, but, but there is a lot of, of step as you can see it, you know, from the mold and every step costs money. So even the middle costs money. So and I don't sculpt, I don't really sculpt to, to sell. I sculpt because I'm obsessed about an animal. Like right now, I'm obsessed about the crocodile. But if I don't sell it, I'm I'm fine. You know, it's I have so much pleasure creating. Uh, the only problem is I don't have any room in my house anymore. So that's the only problem. Well, when I was over there the other day, I mean, he, it, the, these these are everywhere. And on yeah. the one hand, you think, oh, it's like, you know, a showroom or a warehouse. He'll sell them and out they go. No, no, these are the ones he's keeping for himself. So, yeah, Victor, well, I think I, you're going to have a bigger house. And I have plenty. You know, I have two galleries in Florida who are selling my work. They're doing pretty well. And um, a place here in L.A. where they sell my work. But the pleasure that I get creating, it's bigger than, uh, you know, I don't want to be a snob or anything, but okay, well, they call me, they told me this, I, I sold the piece. I'm like, okay, great. But 
I get more excited finishing a piece and looking at it than you know selling. It's it's just a pleasure to be able to come from a little piece of clay and I end up with uh, with a piece. Mm-hmm. So and especially because I have no background of any artwork, you know, I started like you said just after a trip of Sea of Cortez. That's 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 it. But you said you you enjoy drawing before that, but not sculpting yeah. was just brand new for you. Yeah, I've been drawing since I'm a kid. Um, I've been drawing. Uh, I think I've, I've been drawing every time I had people in my house and I don't want to hang out with them. Family, <laughs> I go to my bedroom and I just draw. I draw a lot of, you know, Marvel, the the, the superhero. So yeah, I, I've been drawing and painting um, since a very long time. Actually, I think the the dental work, the being dental technician using the same technique, lost to us technique, really helped me to uh, because it's exactly the same technique at different scale. So I, I think I think when I put everything together, like I would not be able to sculpt if I was not if I didn't experience. Uh, being a dental technician, I would not be able to sculpt if I didn't like diving as much as I did. So when I put everything together, it looks like, okay, well, I guess I was supposed to do that. So the, the, the world works in mysterious ways. Yep. Yep. So, so does anyone else have any any questions for uh, for Victor? I mean, it's okay if you don't. Or Stephen, do you see any similarities between what's inspiring him and what it inspires you? Yeah, I, I no, I, I mean, I, I guess I have several thoughts and questions. I love the work. Thanks for showing it to us. It, it, I, I think I love seeing, you know, starting with clay. I love the movement and the weight that you're able to achieve in your sculptures, knowing it came from clay. And that yeah. you're also that you're working with, you know, metal and clay are such ponderous, you know, unelegant things in their raw form, and you turn them into this sort of elegant sweeping form that really looks like it has movement in it. And I think that's one of the things I love from what you've done there. And I can see how from your first piece, you you do that more and more. You know, it seems like they're more and more elegant as you've got further and further into it, which is great to see. Yeah, a lot of, um, you know, like I explained earlier, I, I do a lot of work on metal myself. Um, usually, most of the sculptors that I know, they finish their piece in clay. They bring it to the foundry, and oh, that's my medication. Sorry, <laughs> I need it. Um, so they bring to the foundry their piece sculpt, and they the foundry call them when the patina is over. So the step of the mold is done by the foundry. The wax cleaning is, is done by a bunch of lady in the back and clean wax all day. The casting is made over there for sure. The chasing, welding, detailing is done by chaser in the foundry. That's where they make their money. I get the raw metal coming out from the foundry. Mm -hmm. And from there, I go work with my welder. I do all my detailing in my home. I don't want anybody to touch it. And I learn because I learned the hard way on the first few pieces that I made with the foundry, the grinder are grinder. So they don't see what I see in the animal. They just grind it and try to follow whatever shape you give it. So I, I was so upset one day because they grind all the muscle. They were just grinding and grinding. And when I get my piece back, I'm like, I put a lot of muscle in this piece. Where are they? And I was upset. So, so I don't blame them. They're not, usually they're not artists. They're just people who work in the foundry and they try to follow as much as they can what the artist did, but they don't know. So if you find, if you, if you have a way to make um, a master and bring it to them, they will copy as good as they can. But I like working on metal. I like adding, adding some muscle if I didn't have any room to, uh, to put them, I, I just like it. I like the clay. I like the wax. I'm really good with the wax because I was doing teas for years in wax. So I'm good with the wax. I'm good with the clay. 
Uh, I'm not good. I, this, I like doing the wax. I like doing the clay, and I like working on metal. It's always uh, it's it's getting in getting involved with every step of your work. I think it's important. Like for you, like as a painter, you would not ask somebody to do the sky or to do the mountain, and you would do only the animal. You want to be part of the whole piece, the whole painting. Yeah, I mean, I think that's you know, I think our love of certainly underwater stuff is the same, but it's very different paths to get the final. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't, I, I, I'm impressed because I wouldn't trust anyone else with my stuff at all. <laughs> you know, all, all the middle people that you have to use to get your work done. Well, I, so I really like having a canvas in front of me and just, it's just me and the canvas and that's, and that's it. And that will produce the final thing, but it's, um, yeah, you have a long process there. Yeah, yeah. But uh, for you, you you know, you you work in one dimension. Yeah. So you have to create depth, and you know, it's 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 in one two, way. It's a little two dimensions. Yeah. Like two dimensions. Two dimensions. <laughs> so it's, it's a little hard. That what I like about my piece, I can lift it up and look around and 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 just mm. see it, feel it. You know, just with my finger, I can see if I'm missing a muscle on one side compared to the other one. So you you get this kind of uh, feeling that um, that you can actually touch your clay and and feel if it's accurate on both sides. It's it's something that you cannot do. So you have to train your eyes differently than mine. I train my hand more than my eyes, I mm -hmm. think. So it's uh, both very interesting. Yeah. I, I I'm a painter who can create <laughs> a volume on painting. Kaz, go ahead, jump in. Yeah, I have a question because uh, this is really fascinating. Um, when you go, and just so you guys know, Kaz is an animator, so there's another type of artwork. <laughs> but keep going. Yeah. Um, actually, yeah. So when you're out there diving, and I'm sure like you're watching these marine life animals swimming by you, and you're already thinking through in your head what you would like to see. How do you capture the reference? Because your end product is three dimensional, but you know, like we're kind of limited to having cameras, you know, or a video camera that basically takes two dimensional images. So, uh, do you do anything at more than just taking a camera in no, your diving? I, or? I just have a camera, but I take a weird picture. So I would just lay down on the floor and take the shot going over me, or I would just focus on the tail. Uh, mm. I would, I would, most of the people I dive with, or the photographer that I dive with, they have a wide angle and they just take the big shark or, you know, whatever big animal they create. They want to, that's what they want on the picture. And my picture are weird because I'm going to need it, you know, as many, as many detailed pictures that I want. And the experience that I have to be able to jump back in the water the day after because sometimes you feel like you have everything you need. I'm like, okay, I get this, I get this, I get this. As you're sculpting, you're missing some detail. So um, the experience that, that I have with those people inviting me, getting in the water, getting what I need, or asking other diver, this is what I need today to be able to move forward on my piece. And everybody would bring me picture. And um, the beauty of it, it's I've been diving for a long time. I've been diving with shark for a long time. And uh, I know a lot of people, but I'm, I'm able to reach out to them. And uh, I would like, hey, uh, Ken, do you have a tale of an oceanic? And, or sometimes I just put a post on Facebook. Anybody has uh, eyes of a tiger shark? And boom, I get 100 pictures. Wow. It's also, I think I'm trained differently than um, other people. I think my eyes work differently. I see in three dimensions pretty much everything. So... As I'm looking at something, I'm already trying to figure out how I would do it. And the interesting thing about um, not, I don't have any, any background of any art school or anything. When I start a piece, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really freaking out. I'm just like, I figure it out. So it's, it's interesting that I don't, I'm not scared of any new piece that I'm going to, you know, especially the last crocodile that I'm doing. I know how much detail I was going into, but I was like, well, it's going to take more time, but I'm going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. So 
it's it's interesting the way I see animal in Sweden right away. Wow, that's really fascinating. Has anybody ever mentioned the kind of the slight irony of you being a dental technician and doing animals with teeth? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah I mean, jaw, jaws and then crocodiles. You let's, know? let's put it this way, Kaz. If, if a shark needs a bridge, Victor's <laughs> your guy. I would do it. A crocodile, too. I would do it, too. So, <laughs> great. Anybody else? I need a crown and I can't even do it for myself. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Anyone else got questions we want to pose to Victor? We may, we, may have, we may have questioned ourselves out, as it were. Well, once again, let's give a lovely Zoom Seekers thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. To Victor. And again, um, you can, you can uh, what, what's the website, Victor? Is it Victor Dweb? It's, it's my name, victorduyeb.com. Dot com. I couldn't remember if there was like a creations there. And if you forget it, just, you know, email me or you can Google them and it pops right up. You get it by email or get them by phone, however you want. So again, thank you, Victor. And, uh, uh, and, and again, it, interesting, you know, hearing from Stephen last month, Victor this month in terms of, you know, what are you inspiring? You guys have heard photographers over, you know, the months in, in terms of what, what's what and what's going on in the creative process. And that's, that's the fun thing with this. It is a creative uh, process. So uh, I, would, I hope the the way I explained was clear enough. You know, to uh, it's such a tricky way. It's such it a process. It is, and it, know, and it's hard too because for you, for Stephen, for me, if I'm talking about my stuff, a lot of times we understand exactly why we like that photograph or we like that sculpting or we like that painting, and sometimes that's hard to convey to other people. So I. I think hopefully you've you've done a decent job of explaining what's I hope so. What's what? And, and if not, they know where to get a hold of you and we're all yeah, forward I'd notes. Be, uh, I'd be more than happy to explain all anything. good. Anything. All good. So thank you all for joining us again. Next month is going to be uh Tuesday, July eleventh. Uh our speaker is gonna be Stephen Wirtz, who works for California Department of Fish and Wildlife. He is let me talk about marine protected areas. He is the, uh, I won't get his title exactly right, but he's like the regional manager of the Southern California Marine Protected Areas. And one of the things that is significant, um, as many of you know, I've sat on a number of the uh, state MPA committees with uh, Fish and Wildlife for, for well over a decade now. And one of the things that we were always charged with is doing what we call a decadal review after these MPAs first went in, which basically means every 10 years, you really take a look at things and say, is it working? Is it not working? What do we need to change? Et cetera, et cetera. So that process just ended uh, earlier this year. And I asked Stephen to speak to us about that, not only what the process is, but what changes there might be that could be changing boundaries, changing species, restrictions or limits or whatever. And uh, so that's what's, that's what's happening next month. Now it's going to be technically interesting because I will not be here. I will have landed in Yap. And hopefully what's going to happen is it's about 12.30, noon 30 in Yap, when it's 7.30 here in LA. And I'm hoping to hell that I can get the appropriate internet connection at Manta Ray Bay, where I will be for three weeks. Fabulous place to go, by the way. So I'm just sort of putting you on, on notice. If we have any technical problems, it'll be on my end in Yap and we'll just try to make it all work. But hopefully I'll be talking to you from Yap and Stephen will be talking to you from Long Beach, which is where he operates. And hopefully you guys will all be joining us for that on Tuesday, July 11th, which will be my Wednesday, July 12th. But don't let that confuse you. So with that, we thank you again for joining us for this uh, Zoom Seekers. Thank you again, Victor, for being our Speaker tonight, invite you to join us on July 11th. And for the moment, I'm Ken Curtis for Zoom Seekers and Reef Seekers saying thank you all very much. Hope thank you enjoyed you. the talk. I am now going to hit the end meeting for all. It's nothing personal, but I'm, I'm kicking everybody out. Great. Take care, everyone. Thanks a lot.